Like I said, I'm talking about systems programming in Ruby. My name's Andy Delcom. I go by A Delcom on the internet. My last name is not phonetic at all. No one ever gets it right. I work at GitHub, and I work mostly on some more back-end things, so things dealing with the system stuff. I kind of work from basically the bottom of the Rails app to the top of the Git layer. We have an RPC system that gets the data from the file servers to the front ends. If you want to talk about any of that stuff, I would love to talk about it. It's fascinating to me. So the title of this talk is uh, Ruby Systems Programming. And that sort of implies that what I'm going to try and teach you is like how to write systems code and like write these sort of low level things. And that's not really the point at all. The point is much more about learning how these lower level building blocks work in, in the apps that we write every day, but the things that we don't actually do, like the things that we don't actually write, the things that are kind of underneath the, the layer that we work at. So that said, I kind of like to define what systems programming is and what systems software is. This is a quote from Wikipedia. Uh, it says, operate and control the computer hardware and to provide a platform for running application software. And I really like this quote because it kind of breaks it into two pieces. So we're when we're talking about system software, first, we're interacting with the hardware directly, so we're writing very low-level code. We're probably interacting with the kernel. And on the other hand, we're writing a platform for running other software, other application software. So this means is that this, none of the code that we write if we're writing system software is probably going to be user-facing. It's mostly going to be software that other software is going to be running on top of. So the other piece here is that we're running application software on top of this, which is sort of the everything else category. And there's a lot here. So this could be video games, uh, iPhone apps, something that runs on your set-top box. But for this crowd and for me, because this is what I know, I'm going to start sort of narrow the scope down to web software. So we have this large set of building blocks that runs underneath the Rails apps that we write, the Ruby apps that we write. And these are kind of pieces that we don't think about a lot when we're writing just in Rails and writing actions and controllers and things like that. And we're going to start all the way at the bottom and work our way up the stack. So we're going to start all the way at the kernel, so just above the hardware, talk a little bit about system calls and how we interact with the kernel, how we just deal with anything that looks like a file, which is most things in Unix, file descriptors, talk a little bit about sockets, how we do network programming, the protocol we're going to write for web software, HTTP, and uh, I'll show you a little demo at the end, hopefully. This code should, or the, anything that I talk about here, should apply generally to any Unix system. Um, there's pretty much not a lot of overlap with Windows here or other non-Unix systems. But anything specific that I talk about is specifically Linux and Linux x86. This code is generally low enough level that the platform that you're running on and even the hardware you're running on actually matters a lot. That said, my, the demo I'm going to show actually runs on my Mac too, so it's not, not solely Linux. So at the beginning, we have the kernel. And the kernel basically is the thing that runs directly above the hardware. This is the piece that controls all the, the stuff on your system. So generally, this is what a computer looks like. You have the hardware down here. This is like you know, memory and, and maybe hard disks and uh, graphics drivers, sound cards, things like that. That all lives down here, but it doesn't do anything. And above that, you have your code, which runs, which is sort of like everything you think of as software. So any application you write, anything that you run, anything you see, all runs sort of up in that green box. And in the middle here, you have the kernel, which is the mediator between the code that we think of as software and the hardware. And it handles sort of everything, right? So it handles, oh no, OK. <laughs> uh, it handles all of the interactions with the hardware, but it also manages all of those processes that run up there. So in that green box at the top where your code runs, we call this user mode. And this is actually implemented in the CPU, like the difference between what runs in kernel mode and what runs in user mode. And if you're just sticking in user mode, if you're just running the code in user mode, there's very little you can do. I kind of break it down into two things. First, I, what I call math, which is basically any like, thing you're just modifying locally. You have a couple of things, maybe pieces of data. Maybe they're numbers. Maybe you're doing arithmetic. But maybe it's also like two strings, and you're joining strings together, or uh, maybe something lower level like crypto or, I don't know, any, any number of things like that. But it's all with data that you already have and you're basically performing operations on it. So you can't get any new data in. And the se second thing you can do is you can access memory. But this is only memory that you've already been given by the kernel. So with that 
sort of first category when you're doing arithmetic and things like that. So you can store the results and you can move stuff around. But you still aren't getting anything new in. You're not putting anything out from this system. You're very stuck in this box. So what's not here? It's like anything I.O., like I just said, any file access, print anything to the screen, network, anything like that at all. So on the other hand, things in the kernel. This is running in kernel mode. And the kernel on a computer can literally do anything and everything. There's nothing it can't do. It can access any memory on the system. It can write, read and write to any hardware on the system. It can modify any program. It can control what programs run when. But you don't get to run code here, right? This is not your land. You're running still back in user mode. So how do we do all of these things that kernel mode can do, but we can't do in user mode? So we use the system call API. System calls are how we basically make those calls and make modifications to the system that can only happen in kernel mode. So we have our computer again. You're, we're running up in user mode there, and you're down in kernel mode here. And you might sort of think that the way this works is, because we, we, we know now that in user mode you can't do very much, and in kernel mode you can do things like write to files. So you might imagine that what you do is you like chug along in user mode, and you, and you get to a spot where you want to like write to a log file, and so you switch over to kernel mode, and you write a couple of lines of code to uh, write out to a file, and then you switch back into user mode. And that's not how this works at all. So we use system calls, and we actually basically stop execution of our program, and we ask the kernel to do something on our behalf. And it does something like write a file or open a file. It returns back to us, and we kind of keep going on our merry way. But we don't ever actually get to run code in kernel mode. So you can see uh, all of the system calls that your program is executing with an strace command. This is the Unix version. There's also dtrust on Mac if you're uh, Linux. Sorry, this is Linux. dtrust on Mac, which uses the dtrace API. I think there's probably similar ones for other Unix operating systems. I have no idea how to do this in Windows. Uh, but you can basically take any process on your computer and see what system calls it's making. And there's probably going to be a lot of them. So I did this uh, just with one request locally with one of the apps at GitHub. You can see it go by. These are all system calls. See, these are all the system calls that happens for one request locally. This is in development mode, so it would be a little bit less in uh, production. But there's a lot of stuff here. And some of it's really esoteric, like uh, get sig proc mask and uh, sig alt stack and things like that. These are, I don't really know what they do. There, there's some esoterica in system calls. But there's some ones here that sort of make sense, right? So we have close. There's an accept. We have a send to. Um, a few other things there. So. This is basically how everything gets done in your web request. This update's much faster. We, we get many more syscalls than the frame rate of this video. So in that request, there was actually 120,000 syscalls for one request. So you might imagine that because we can't do anything without using syscalls, and because we do 120,000 syscalls in one request just to do anything at all, that this API would be very large, that there would be lots and lots of things that you would have to do to know to be able to uh, to do this. And it's really actually small. This is the uh, entirety of the syscall table in Linux. There's 326 possible things you can call. This is in the kernel. If it is not in this table, you cannot call it. It won't know what to do with it. So the API boundary is really small. To make an actual syscall, this is how we do this. This is actually the assembly for this. So this is the open syscall. Every syscall in that syscall table is, uh, has a number associated with it which is why that, that syscall table exists. So open happens to be syscall number five. So we move five into EAX. The args to the syscall go into the additional registers. E EAX, EBX, and ECX are registers here. Uh, if you have more than like five or so arguments, the method is different, but that almost never happens. Most syscalls take a very small number of arguments. And then down here, we trigger this interrupt. So, th so this is the interrupt uh, assembly call. And we're triggering the 80 in hex syscall. This is the i386. So software interrupt. This transfers execution to the kernel. The interrupt handler fires. It looks up which interrupt handler or which handler should handle the 80 hex uh, interrupt, which is, happens to be the syscall handler. And the syscall handler then looks up the EAX register, finds out what we're doing open, executes the open code, and returns code back to you. But this actually stops execution of your program and starts execution in the kernel. You, you are no longer executing your code after that interrupt happens. So you can see there's, you're not. There's no code that you're running, no even assembly code that you're running that actually happens in kernel mode. I think this is kind of cool.
So I, this is kind of also another just fun fact, but of that syscall table, um, there, it's, it's one basically big array, and that it's a, like a lookup into it, those numbers. So there can't be blank spots in that table. So if there's like a uh, syscall that only happens on one architecture, or there's one that has been deprecated and isn't used anymore, or there's one reserved for future use, they, can't, they still have to be there. So uh, of those 326 in the syscall table, 65 of them are defined as the sys ni syscall. And that ni stands for not implemented. So 65 of the syscalls that I was talking about earlier don't even do anything. You don't even use them. So we're down to like 260 some odd total syscalls that you can call in Linux. Windows, on the other hand, there's some, say, thousands. We don't have the codes. So we can't look and count them. But uh, nobody really knows exactly how many there are. But there's many, many more than Linux. And I think it's kind of cool that in Unix land and in Linux land, we, we have such a small API boundary that we have to understand. And in Windows, it's much larger, even though we have the same total power. So with these syscalls, there's a ways, like, we need to be able to talk about the things that happen in the kernel. And in many cases, what we're talking about actually looks like a file to the, to the kernel. Linux describes sort of everything as a file. We have this, this uh, sort of fact, I guess, that people say, truism, everything is a file which is not quite literally true. Um, there are other operating systems that take this much farther than Linux does, but in general, for most cases that we talk about, everything is a file. So we have a list of things that are files, not exhaustive, includes files, but also um, a bunch of other stuff that don't really seem like files, like printers and uh, hard drives and maybe pipes for doing uh, interprocess communication, shared memory, graphics cards, the uh, terminal that you type into, and also, sockets, which is how we do network programming. We'll talk a little, little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. So with this file API, or with, with these file descriptors, when you have any of these things, once you've got them, and you're talking about them with syscalls, you use these file descriptors. And the API that you can use to, to, to talk to them is really, really small. So all four of these syscalls are how you basically write and read from uh, file descriptors, or anything that looks like a file. All of these take the file descriptor numbers that you get handed when you open any of those things. And this is pretty much it. There's, a, there's probably more that take uh, file descriptors, but this is most of the, the API. So you can read from the files, you can write to the files, and you can close them so you don't have access to them anymore. And the LSEQ one is a little bit special. So file descriptors are kind of defined to have a type. So some are like block type, like files, like you have a list of blocks that you can read from, so you can seek around in it. So you can say, like, I want to go back to the beginning or go to the end, but if you're reading a stream of bytes off the network, you obviously can't rewind that stream. So that also is part of the file API, but it doesn't work in stream tile type files. So this is a, so there's a couple of interesting things here, actually. Um, so this is all the file descriptors that are open for one uh, unicorn on production at GitHub. There's one thing here, so this is the, uh, you notice how I'm getting this, is I'm LSing this proc file system. So this is slash proc slash PID slash FD. This is just the directory with all of the file descriptors that this process has open. So this is kind of, is also part of that everything is a file thing. This is how you get information from the kernel about processes that are running. If you are ever on a Linux system, go explore the proc file system, it's really cool. There's all kinds of stuff in there. So, second, we have three file descriptors that are pretty much on every single process that you ever have, unless they've been closed. And that's zero, one, and two. The first three over there. So zero is standard in, one is standard out, and two is standard error. Every process, by default, when you start it, has these three file descriptors open, and they're pointed to those things. This is a unicorn, so we have redirected those to certain things. Standard in comes from dev null, because this is a server, there's no uh, standard in that's happening. And then standard out and standard error are going to this unicorn log file. There's a couple of other log files here. Number 35 is the pigments log for when we do syntax highlighting. We have the production log for Rails over there, number 10. Uh, somewhere else, there's another one. Anyway, uh, but there's a couple of like pipes here for doing some probably interprocess communication. But what we have a lot of here is these sockets. And these sockets are for pretty much anything that's communicating over the network. So this could be uh, the socket that we're listening on to do the web traffic from this unicorn. They could be a connection to MySQL or Redis, or memcached. Uh, it could be an established connection to a client that we're actually currently handling a request for. 
and many other things. It's probably a lot of client connections and then a, like a couple of server-side connections. But this is everything that's happening, and these are all basically abide by that file API. So with that file API, I talked only about how we read to and write from them, but there's no, we don't, there's no API as part of the file API for creating new file descriptors. And that's because depending on what type of the file, what type of file descriptor you're getting at, there's actually different APIs for all of them. So for doing network communication, the API is called the BSD sockets API. First, a little bit of history here. This is a very brief history of Unix. Um, back in like 1963 or so, well, in the early 1960s, it lasted a couple of years, there was this research operating system called Multix that was developed at a consortium of a bunch of different companies, including MIT and AT&T Bell Labs and uh, a few other places. And it was trying to be, it, it basically was too uh, adventurous. It did not work. It was never used for anything real. It only was sort of exploring some concepts. But it, it, it basically failed. Like, it stopped happening at some point. But a couple of the guys, uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, that had worked on that, went to AT&T Bell Labs and started this much smaller scoped operating system that they called Unix, which was a play on the Multics thing. So Multics was multi-user. Unix was originally single user. That's how the name came about. Uh, and that was about 1970. And I find this really interesting, but there's the history of why Unix was available to be licensed, the, the source code, was due to AT&T Bell Labs going through the antitrust settlement at that time. So they were prohibited from selling and having the operating system be proprietary. So they had to give away uh, source code licenses to it, to a sp specifically universities. I'm not entirely confident on all the vagaries of why, or like what, what it took to get a license back then, but definitely universities could get licenses to the source code for Unix, which is cool. So in 1978, there was one, there was a guy at UC Berkeley in California that took the original System 5 Unix from AT&T Bell Labs and wanted to port it to VAX, and so he ported the software over, added a bunch of utilities around it, and released it as BSD. Uh, the guy that did that, his name is Bill Joy. One of the things that he added to BSD at that time was a little program called VI, which you might have heard of, what he's probably more famous for, but he was also one of the guys that originally did BSD. Five years later, 1983, uh, BSD 4.2 came out, and this was right around the time that the original standardization for the TCP IP stand, uh, standard was coming out, and this was basically the first real TCP IP stack that you could use. And so in 1983 to today, it's about 30 years, and the, the API has effectively not changed. And this is one of the few pieces of like sort of API and code that actually got ported to Windows as well. So on Windows, they also have the same BSD sockets API. I just think it's really cool that we're today writing code that is using a 30-year-old API on 40-year-old software that was started almost 50 years ago. This is pretty much the entirety of the BSD Sockets API. This is the server side portion, so if you're connecting from a client side, you're probably not gonna use, well, there, there's another couple that you use, but the API is really small, and this handles pretty much everything that we can do. I'll go through them each in turn. Um, the first one is socket. This is how you create a new BSD socket. Uh, this is how you tell what type of socket you're gonna have. So if we're doing TCP IP v4, that would be where you tell it that. You could also do like Unix domain sockets, IPv6, you could do UDP rather than TCP. Bind tells the kernel that we want, or like what address we want to listen on. So this is where you can tell it what port we're coming in on, what address we're listening on on. But the socket is still not in listening mode. It's not ready to accept incoming connections. Listen tells the kernel to turn that socket into a listening socket, so it's actually passively waiting for incoming connections. Accept will take a new connection off that socket. It'll actually block and wait for a new connection to come in. Once a new connection comes in, it returns that another new socket, which is also a file descriptor, but references that one client directly. Then, once we have that uh, client socket from the, from the accept call, then all we have is a file descriptor, and we can use the exact same thing that we were talking about earlier with the file API to read, read from it, write to it, and close it when we're done. So this API is about how we basically establish connections, but it's, it doesn't care what data we're talking about on top of it. That's sort of the next level up. So just a little brief overview of HTTP. Most of you have probably seen this before. I'll try and go pretty fast, but um, HTTP is basically a, a request response. So in that sort of se session, we're gonna accept a connection, read the request from it, 
generate a response, like process something, send a response back over the wire, and close the connection. You can keep connections open, but it's a, that's kind of like a, a, a specific version of HTTP. So this is a generic HTTP request. The first line is important there. That's always the same. It always starts with the HTTP verb that we're talking about. So in this case, it's a get request, but it could be a post, a put, a delete, a head, options, and on down. The second parameter there is the uh, path, which is basically everything after the domain name in the URL when you look at it. If there was params, they would be here as well, all in that same thing. And then we have the HTTP version we're using. This is HTTP 1.1. The next three there are headers that we're sending. So we can send any number of headers. These are relatively arbitrary. You can send more headers than this if you want. Uh, this was a curl I did against Google, and we're accepting any content type back. If this was a post and we wanted to send a request body as well, there would be one blank new line and then the whole request body. That, that would be like form parameters or some JSON or something like that if we're doing an API request. So the server then processes this, requ this request. It returns a response. The response looks something like this. Again, we have this first line, which de declares what version of HTTP we're using. And then it returns the status code that we return. So it's always both the numeric and the text version of the status code. This is 200 OK. Could also be like 404 not found, uh, 500 in a terminal server error, or any of the other ones. Then we also have the same set of things. We have the headers that are coming back. The format's the same. Key value with the colon in between. The date, some cach caching content. Uh, the content type that we're getting back, what kind of server served it, and this can go on and on, as you probably know. One blank new line, and then the response data. So in this case, this would probably be HTML for google.com, because that's what I did the curl against. So let's look at some code, finally. We've gotten to that point. Uh, some caveats here. This is not production code. There are huge security vulnerabilities here. You should never write code that looks like this if you're going to write like low-level code. There, there's more that you need to do. But this actually does work. I will show you that it works momentarily. But. So this is a 23-line uh, HTTP server. It does work. I'll go through it again line by line to talk about each one in turn. First, we require the socket library to get all the, the good bits in Ruby land. We set up some constants just to kind of make the code a little more concise. Then we get into the meat of it. So this is the Ruby call that ends up calling the socket uh, BSD socket call, or API call. We're creating a new one, and we're saying it. we're going to have an inet socket with a stream type. So this is IPv4 and TCP. If we were doing uh, IPv6, that would say inet6. If we were doing UDP rather than TCP, that could say datagram. You could keep going. There's many, many more socket types, but they get really esoteric really fast. You could also do Unix domain sockets, which is somewhat common, but kind of everything beyond that, less so. Then we're going to do the bind call. This is the... Uh, the thing that tells it what the kernel where we're listening to. First, we create this uh, uh, structure, basically, for what kind of socket we're going to listen on. So this is listening on port 11.080 on localhost. And we're going to call the bind API call there. So this, the, this socket is now listening. Well, it's not listening yet, but it's, it's attached to port 11.080. Then we're going to call listen. The parameter to listen is how deep the queue is. So like I said before, we accept connections off of this listen socket, but if we're not currently accepting a connection then, and someone comes in, then it queues it up. And this says that we can have five people waiting to queue while we're waiting to accept the next one. Five connections waiting to queue. So then in a while loop, we're going to call accept. The accept API returns uh, a tuple, basically, and the, the first one is the actual file descriptor we're talking about. So now we have a client socket. And once this returns, we actually have an established connection coming in from the, from the server, or from the client. This is my uh, very high performance, 100% standards compliant HTTP request uh, parser. If you remember, the uh, first line of an HTTP call is this get path version. So I just split on spaces and take the second one. That's the path. <laughs> We're going to expand the file name, or expand the path using that path from the current file, so like anything in the current directory. So if the file exists, and it's a file, we read the contents off disk, we write out that we're doing a 200 OK, we send the content length of the, the file length, and the contents of the file. If, or that, that's the 200 OK, so we have the constant up there defined. If, on the other hand, that file didn't exist, we just send the not found, which was defined up there. So that's that HTTP 
uh, 404 response code. Finally, after we're done, we close the socket, so that way the, this terminates the TCP connection, so it doesn't stay open. And that's it. It's a 23-line HTTP server in Ruby. I will make sure that it works. So, here I have just a directory. It's got two files in it, that server file, which looks basically the same as the other one. And there's just a file called foo.txt here, which I will serve. We're gonna run the file with uh, Ruby. Go to, so we didn't pass a file, right? So we get a not found. We give it a file that actually does exist. We get the contents back. And of course, because there's not a lot here, we can also just get the, the server file itself. <laughs> <laughs> so it works. Like we have 23 line HTTP server. That's pretty cool. Yep, here we go. So that is a 23 line HTTP server that actually does work successfully. So just to prove that I'm not uh, making this all up and that this actually does get used, I uh, went and found the places where this actually gets used inside of Unicorn. So we actually make the same API calls here. The, this is an example for the IPv6 way that it listens because the IPv4 one is a little bit different. It does it in C rather than in Ruby, so the API calls are hidden. But you can see here, we call socket.new. We pass inet6 to it and stream. so we're creating a TCP IPv6 socket. We do the same exact bind call with the, creating the same structure, so with the port and the address. And then uh, rather than accept, we, call it, we use select here because accept only listens on one file descriptor. And so if you want to listen on like multiple sockets at the same time, you can, if you're accepting on one, you're obviously not listening on the other. So select is basically the same thing, but you can listen on multiple at the same time. and It'll just return whichever one comes first. But we actually do the same, the same exact API calls down inside of Unicorn. So again, Starting from the bottom, we have the kernel, runs on top of hardware. To talk to the kernel, which is how we get to basically anything that the hardware is related to, we use these system calls. If we're talking about anything that uses a file, that, or that looks like a file basically, including sockets, we're gonna use the file descriptor API. We use sockets to write networking servers, and we use HTTP on top of sockets to do the web, basically. So this is everything from basically directly above the hardware to directly below your Rails app. If you're interested in more reading about this, um, there's a couple of books here that I think are really good. This one's Linux System Programming by Robert Love, who uh, is a kernel developer from Novell. He's awesome. This, is a, this just came out in second edition a couple of months ago, so it's really up to date. Covers all about Linux system calls. It's really actually fun to read. It's pretty cool. Uh, it doesn't really cover the networking side of things. It's more about the system calls and all the, all the, uh, all the system calls that you can do in Linux, basically. For network programming, there's a uh, usually referred to as UNP, Unix Network Programming by Richard Stevens. This is much, much older, and uh, it's a beast. It's really thick, but it covers everything you could ever want to know about network programming. It's better as a reference than like something you'd read end to end. Also by Richard Stevens is Unix programming, or Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment, APUE, which is basically similar to Linux System Programming, but for everything Unix. It's huge, but it's a beast. I mean, it's a, it's a good reference again. Good books. So uh, that's it. Thanks a lot. Again, I'm Andy on the internet, Adelcom. Hey,